everybody it's me countess back with another video my first video of 2024 so happy happy new year everybody let's make this year a good one today guys i want to uh briefly go over another individual who was on the scene in the 1960s counterculture and beyond that um, somebody who has personally influenced me in my own life, uh, that is Mr. David Bowie. Um, I was first introduced to Mr. Bowie back in the 80s when I was a wee lass and uh, Labyrinth, the, mu the movie Labyrinth. I was introduced to him uh, as Jareth the Goblin King and my sort of fascination with Bowie you know, started way before I even knew the Beatles. I even knew who, you know, Billy was, Wings, all that jazz. I, I just had this, like, I don't know, it was weird. Like, I felt a weird fascination with Bowie. And so, naturally, I got to get into his music more. I actually got to see him perform live back in 2000. One, I believe. Um, he was touring with like the Blue Man Group and Busta Rhymes and Moby and I could give a flying fig about all those other people. Um, when Bowie came out on the stage it is the only time that I ever cried at a concert because I was like five feet away from him. You know I would not move from my place. I had such a great place where I could see him and it was just a magical night. So dance, magic, dance. It sure did that night. <laughs> um, yeah. So um, I found this interesting bit of information about Crowley. I'm sorry, about Bowie and his ties to Crowley. Um, and I just thought that I would share it with you guys because he has been a huge influence on popular culture. Um, even to this day, I hate to say it even, you know, my own daughter was raised with Bowie blasting all around her all the time. And that's my influence, you know, but it's like a constant influence, just like the Beatles have on the world. So it's worth taking a look at this man. He, uh, was just very well versed in the occult. So, this starts David Bowie as he ascended to world fame in the 1970s. Bowie became obsessed with using occult magic to attain successes and protect himself from demonic forces. In the 70s, Bowie, who was born David Jones, read as much of Crowley's materials as possible. My whole interest was in Kabbalah and Crowleyism, <clears throat> that whole dark and rather fearsome netherworld of the wrong side of the brain. The song, after all, Bowie sang, quote, live till your rebirth and do what you will, unquote a restatement of Crowley's favorite dictum, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. He also stated that rock has always been the devil's music. You can't convince me of that, that it isn't. I honestly believe everything I've said. I believe rock and roll is dangerous. I feel that we are only heralding something even darker than ourselves. In 1971, in the song Quicksand, it refers to Crowley and the Golden Dawn. Bowie singing, I'm closer to the Golden Dawn, immersed in Crowley's uniform of imagery. In March of 1975, Bowie moved to Los Angeles, where he was reported to be drawing pentagrams on the wall, experimenting with the pack of tarot cards that Crowley created, 
chanting spells, making hexes, and testing and investigating the powers of the devil against those of the Jewish mystical system, the Kabbalah. While in Los Angeles, <clears throat> excuse me, while in Los Angeles, Bowie dabbled in pagan cults and thought that two witches had, had cast a spell over him so that he could inseminate them in a black magic ceremony and thus bring a son of Satan into the world. He also experimented with anal erotic techniques. One friend said, David never slept. He was in a coke storm. We would be up for three or four days at a time. Bowie felt inclined to go on every bizarre tangent about Aleister Crowley or the Nazis or numerals a lot. He was completely wired. He was on the edge of paranoia all the time. Bowie traveled straight into the heart of psychic darkness, lost in his own world. These were his cocaine crazed years where his weight dropped close down to 80 pounds. Bowie remembered. It all happened in LA. There was something horrible permeating in the air in those days in LA. The stench of Manson and the Sharon Tate murders. And I was interested in the symbols of the Nazis. I think they had the most powerful set of symbols that I've ever seen in both in terms of political history. The swastika. They took a Buddhist and Hindu symbol, the Eastern symbol of the sun, and turned it around so that it became a symbol of the dark. And that intrigued me about the Nazis. Who is the Magus? Who is the black magician? After practicing black magic in Los Angeles, Bowie found it necessary to exorcise his pool. His wife, Angie, claimed that the pool was definitely, absolutely, no doubt about it, bubbling with an energy for which there was no explanation. And she retells the story, explaining the house as a white cube surrounding an indoor swimming pool. David liked the place, but I thought it was too small to meet our needs for very long. And I wasn't crazy about the pool. In my experience, indoor pools are always a problem. This one was no exception, albeit not in any of the usual ways. Its drawback was one I hadn't encountered before and haven't seen or heard of since. Satan lived in it. With his own eyes, David said he'd seen him rising up out of the water one night. Angie called Wally M. Lark back in New York for help. David wanted an exorcism. A Greek Orthodox church in L.A. would have been available for such a service, um, but David wouldn't have it. He said, no strangers were allowed. So there we stood with just Wally's instructions and a few hundred dollars worth of books, talismans, and assorted items from Hollywood's comprehensive selection of fine occult emporia. There he was, then primed and ready, she continues. The proper books and doodads were arranged on a big old-fashioned lectern. The incantation began, and although I had no idea what was being said or what language it was being said in, I couldn't stop a weird, cold feeling rising up in me as David droned on and on. There's no easy or elegant way to say this, so I'll just say it straight. At a certain point in the ritual, the pool began to bubble. The, it bubbled vigorously, perhaps thrashed is a better term, in a manner inconsistent with 
any explanation involving air filters or the like. As David watched this happening in absolute terror, I tried to be flippant. Well, dear, aren't you clever? It seems to be working. Something's making a move, don't you think? But I couldn't keep it up. <laughs> it was very, very strange. I was having trouble accepting what my eyes were seeing. We both left the pool in a hurry and David told me to check up on it from time to time. I kept my eye on it for the next 40 minutes or so and nothing unusual happened. And so with my heart in my mouth and I slid one of the glass doors open and ignoring David's panic screams, went to the edge and looked in. I saw what I saw. Nothing can change that. On the bottom of the pool was a large shadow or stain, which had, hadn't been there before the ritual. It was in the shape of a beast of the underworld, and it reminded me of those twisted, tormented gargoyles screaming silently from the spires of medieval cathedrals. It was ugly, shocking, malevolent. It frightened me, and I still don't know what to think about that night. It runs directly counter to my pragmatism and my everyday faith in the integrity of the normal world, and it confuses me greatly. What troubles me the most is that if you were to call that stain the mark of Satan, I don't see how I could argue with you. <sighs> David, of course, insisted that we move from the house as quickly as possible. And we did that. But I've heard subsequent tenants haven't been able to remove that shadow. Even though the pool has been painted over a number of times, the shadow has always come back. Of the exorcism. Bowie later said, I really walked into other worlds. While living in California, Bowie visited filmmaker Kenneth Anger with current girlfriend Ava Cherry. The meeting lasted for only 20 minutes. At Anger's advice, Bowie began storing his urine so he could imbibe it. He preserved his hair and nail clippings to keep witches from cursing him. His wife claimed he had made frantic, cabalistic calculations of his own correspondence, stored his own urine in a fridge, and was obsessed about letting anyone get a hold of his nail clippings and hair trimmings. Bowie would travel to Berlin in 1976, leaving his possessed swimming pool and his ferocious cocaine addiction in Los Angeles. His next album, Station to Station, which was released in January 1976, contains many occult references. I was up to my neck in magic. He learned while living in the Los Angeles fast lane. He described the album as extremely dark, the nearest album to a magic treaty that I have ever written. The song, Station to Station, references Crowley and the Kabbalah. Here we are, one magical movement from Cathar to Malkuth. There are you, you drive like a demon from station to station, the return of the thin white duke, throwing darts in lovers' eyes. The return of the thin white duke, making sure white stains. The path of Cathar to Malkuth in the Kabbalah is nothing less than the representation of the magic of the new Aeon. The magic of the Aeon of Horus consists in the realization of the identity of Kether, which is Nuit, and Malkuth, Hadith. The numbers of these Sephiroth are 11 and 10 respectively. Their union in the consciousness of the magician produces Tipereth, the sun, 
slash sun Horus, the Lord of the Aeon. That's by Kenneth Grant, that quote. White Stains is also the title of a slim volume of verse by Alistair Crowley. Bowie read widely. David is an extraordinarily well-read man, you know, said Johann Rennick, director of Bowie's incredibly satanic posthumous video, Black Star. He read The Spear of Destiny and the bestseller, The Morning of the Magicians, in 1960. He covered the books of Israel Rigardi, Arthur Waite, and Crowley mentor, McGregor Mathers. He covered books about the occultism of Hitler and Heimler, telling Playboy in 1976. Rock stars are fascists. Adolf Hitler was one of the first rock stars. Think about it. Look at some of his films and see how he moved. I think he was quite as good as Jagger. It's astounding, and boy, when he hit that stage, he worked an audience. Good God! He was no politician. He was a media artist. He used politics and theatrics and created this thing that governed and controlled the show for 12 years. The world will never see his like again, thank God. The world still I'm sorry, he staged a country. People aren't very bright, you know. They say they want freedom, but when they get the chance, they pass up Nietzsche and choose Hitler because he would march into a room and speak and music and lights would come on at strategic moments. It was rather like a rock and roll concert. The kids would get very excited Girls got hot and sweaty, and guys wished it was them up there. That, for me, is the rock and roll experience. Like many other occultists, Bowie had encounters with interdimensional beings. A friend and I were traveling in the English countryside when we both noticed a strange object hovering above a field, from then on, I have come to take this phenomen phenomena seriously. I believe that what I saw was not the actual object, but a projection of my own mind trying to make sense of this quantum topological doorway into dimensions beyond our own. It's as if our dimension is one, but one among an infinite number of others. Bowie also referenced the dog star, the bright star in the heavens, Sirius, in the song Lyric of Love to Leah. Bowie sings, come my love and let us dance to the moon and Sirius. Some have argued that he references Sirius in his most popular song, Let's Dance, singing about the Sirius moonlight, a homonym for the star Sirius. Let's dance. For fear that grace should fall, let's dance. For fear tonight is all, let's sway. You could look into my eyes, let's sway, under the moonlight, the serious moonlight. <laughs> Sorry for that. <laughs> Early in his career, Bowie admitted he was bisexual, describing it as the best thing that ever happened to me, although he later said the public admission was a mistake. Later his, in his life, he said, I'm pretty much over my affection for men. The only time I get halfway wistful for those old days is in Japan. All those little boys are so cute. I just want to take them all up to my room. Later in life, Bowie married Somali-born supermodel Iman. In his later years, Bowie used a fetal tissue regime to stay young. His last album, Black Star, was intended to be a parting gift from the dying Bowie to his fans. 
the video for the song Black Star, representing the planet Saturn, contains profound occult symbolism reflecting Bowie's occult knowledge. In the video, a bejeweled skull under an occulted sun representing a dead Major Tom slash David Bowie is transported by a holder, a beautiful Scandinavian forest spirit, to the village of Ormen, meaning serpent, a small town underneath three monoliths. Bowie sings, in the center of it all, a phrase taken from one of Aleister Crowley's version, The Ritual of the Hexagram. Thirteen women, the necessary number for a witch's coven, in the city of Ormond perform a ritual with the bejeweled skull of Bowie, giving rise to a beast-like creature. The creature flays a scarecrow on a cross, a depiction of Christ as a new dawn arises in the background. David Bowie died of liver cancer at the age of 69 on January 10th, 2016. What a curious age, right? 69, that makes me think of the yin-yang, right? <laughs> the blending of opposites. Also, I find it very interesting talking about um, being in the center of it all. And that's part of Crowley's version of the ritual of the hexagram. Remember when we talked about the world tonight with uh, Billy being at the center of a circle. Bam, right there. <laughs> yes, yeah, so, you know, and um, Bowie's fascination with Hitler and the Nazis um, makes me think back to um, what they say in the memoirs about EMI's affiliation with the Nazis. You know, they brought over a bunch of very, very skilled ses session musicians who were Nazis. They brought over scientists, kind of just like America with Operation Paperclip. Um, but John had a sort of adoration for Hitler as well, because he wanted to see the good in that man that everybody hated. And he saw that Hitler, like Bowie saw, that Hitler had this presence about him that was admirable to them, you know, and what they stood for. And it, you know, the memoirs even says how um, John's adoration uh, of Hitler endeared him to the cabal more. Um, Bowie actually signed two EMI records in 1983. So he wasn't part of them back in his cocaine craze days, but he was a part of EMI when he released Let's Dance. So yeah, I just find all of it interesting. Like always, these people were just fascinated with Crowley and the idea of liberation, liberation from everything. Do what thou wilt. And that's what it all boils down to in the end. Yeah. Anyways, guys, let me know what you think about uh, Mr. Bowie. Again, it's like he's one of my all-time favorite artists out there um, because he is not just a musical artist. Just like he said about Hitler, he is a media artist. He's great at visual um, symbolism. He himself is a symbol of the great work with his androgyny. And yeah, I got suckered in to, uh, at a very young age. Um, and I still, I still do enjoy listening to his music, I must admit, just like I do with the Beatles and Wings. You know, it's, yeah. It is what it is. Anyways, I will quit rambling on. 
Let me know what you guys think about uh, Mr. Bowie in the comments below. And I will see you guys in my next video. Until then, take care. Bye, guys. But though they may be parted, there is still a chance built that they will see.